Good morning. I'm Dr. Steve Stites, Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System. Welcome back to Open Mics with Dr. Stites. Today we're talking about wet macular degeneration. It doesn't mean you got water in your eye. It's an eye disorder that causes a blurred vision or a blind spot. It happens when abnormal blood vessels grow underneath the retina. You can see it in this comparison picture. I'm going to have the ophthalmologist here explain it in just a moment. The normal healthy eye is on the left. The image on the right is of an eye with macular, wet macular degeneration. People with this are at risk of losing their vision faster than those with dry acute macular degeneration. We're going to talk about what it means to be wet and dry. But before we meet our patient and her doctor, let's do some morning rounds. There's big news coming out of Washington, D.C. yesterday regarding prescription drugs and how the government determines their cost. For the first time, Medicare, which purchases drugs, will be allowed to negotiate what it pays for drugs. Up until now, Medicare was required to pay whatever price the drug maker sets. Now, most insurance companies and other groups do bargain with drug companies about how much they're going to pay. But Medicare, because it's been part of government, has never done that. Yet Medicare is the largest consumer, as far as health insurance, so to speak, in the nation. This has led the drug prices in America, at least in part, being much higher than they are in other countries. In many ways, the cost of bringing drugs to market is underwritten by the United States. Here's a list of the first 10 drugs up for negotiation. There are some of the most commonly prescribed drugs amongst older adults, frankly, amongst all adults. And if the cost goes down, the government could save tens of billions of dollars. Some have estimated to be as high as 80 to 100 billion dollars. Things might get cheaper for patients too, but that does remain to be seen. Joining me to talk more about this is Rick Coldry, our Vice President of Pharmacy and Health Professions here at the Health System. He's been on our program before. Rick knows drugs. I don't mean <coughs> that in a bad way, by the way. I mean that in all the good <laughs> no, ways not problem, Steve. Uh, There you go. Yeah. Okay, Rick, help us understand the status quo and yeah. why the government, why don't they already negotiate the, for the uh, price of drugs? This is interesting. So uh, the government is required to pay a reasonable cost for drugs or really anything it purchases. And so that has kind of been the standard as far as uh, drug prices and what Medicare has paid and why negotiation hasn't really uh, been on the table until now. And as you know, the drug companies are fighting pretty hard against that happening. Oh, yes, they have. Now, if you remember back when um, initially the Affordable Care Act was was passed back in, oh, was it 2009, 2008, 2009, whatever, and um, uh, they tried to write this into that legislation, but it got taken out because of all the drug industry opposition. That's right. It got put back in during another recent government law, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's been back and forth quite a bit. Uh, you know, there's a big push for the U.S. government to be able to negotiate prices. Every other major government that I'm aware of has that authority to negotiate drug prices, except for in the U.S. And you know, the, the what I understand is that's the leading legal argument, and you know, pharmacists are going to take it all the way to the Supreme Court uh, that negotiating prices with Medicare isn't following the rules of the government paying a reasonable price for drugs because they believe the price is already reasonable. Yeah, they think that there, so this could lead to some price fixation, I believe, and, and uh, mm -hmm. I suppose that maybe that's a risk. On the other hand, we know that Americans play, pay ridiculously high prices relative to Canada and other de uh, de democratic countries, and again, mm -hmm. essentially we are underwriting the cost of that. One of the things we hear is that this means that we're going to have less drug innovation. Yet, this is perhaps maybe a fraction of the operating <clears throat> margin for a drug company that already averages 20 to 50 percent operating margin. In fact, considered one of the highest and most profitable injuries in the country are big pharmaceuticals. That's exactly right. And you and I have talked about this a number of times, Steve. Yes, we have. Um, where does the innovation really come from? Is it coming from the drug companies, or where does it start? Well, let's talk about that because here's what we know. A lot of it um, starts with us. Yeah, you know I'm going to get on. I, 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 I you promise are. I'm going to fall off my own soapbox, but here's the deal. <laughs> you know, if you look at how new drugs are brought to market, now there's two classes of drugs. There's truly novel therapies, that is, yeah. we're establishing a new, a whole new area of therapy, or we're doing what's called a look-alike drug. A look-alike drug says, hey, I've been on a beta blocker, I've been on a tunnel or I've been on lebetalol, and now there's another form of that coming out. 
that's called, called a look-alike drug. It's really not novel therapy. But if we invent a whole new class of antihypertensives that work, where does that usually start from? And actually the answer is over half of those, much higher than half actually, come from academic hey, medical centers academic like medical ours, centers. as right. well as some of the spin-off companies from AFs, uh, um, AMCs. academic medical centers yep. or AMCs. And drug, into, a pharmacy usually is doing uh, look-alike therapy. And occasionally they'll have their own breakthroughs, but mostly it's through look-alike therapy. And so as a result, when you step back and you look at this, you're like, wow. So really a lot of the important new breakthroughs in drug therapy, like the new CAR T therapies for cancer, et cetera, mm -hmm. those are all coming out of, in, uh, out of academic medical centers That's first. Right. Yep. So um, there's going to be a battle now between CMS and Big Pharma. Do you think the health system has a dog in this fight, so to speak? So, you know, I think there's a lot of things to be sorted out. I, I was just taking a look at what's the timeline on this whole deal, right? So the drug companies have until August to even agree whether they're going to enter in negotiations. The negotiation will be complete for a year until next September of 2024. And then after that, the prices aren't set to go into effect until January of 2026. So we have a lot of uh, discussion, conflict, disagreement, legal battles to really happen before we can really understand what the implication is going to be. Although it's all speculation. So. Yeah, I think and the question the next way is if they go down for Medicare, is they going to go down for other just mm -hmm. routine people, r r regular folks? And I think the answer to that is it really could. It could. Because I, mean, I think of, that's the theory. Because yeah. a, a lot of places set their, a lot of co companies set their price or what they're going to pay based on what Medicare pays. That's very, very common. So it could push it down, it's possible. So I think this all came out of the Inflation Reduction Act. It's interesting, I saw a poll yesterday that said 85% of Democrats and 77% of Republicans favor the ability of Medicare to do this. Mm -hmm. I think most people are a little tired of, of having to pay so much for a prescription medication, especially some of the lookalikes that really aren't changed all that much. And also, when you look at comparison to other countries, and some people try to get their drugs shipped in from Mexico and Canada, yep. because they're buying the same drug, but they're buying at a markedly discounted That's price. That's right. All right, well, thank you very much for Coldry for Always joining my us pleasure. this morning. Always a pleasure to have you on. Thank we'll you. We'll see you again soon. All I'm right, sure take care, be, well, I'm sure we'll be talking about this a little bit more. All right, back to our topic of wet macular degeneration. The monthly treatment for this condition might be hard to watch if you're a little squeamish, but this patient handles it like a champ. And oh, by the way, she has a special relationship to one of our own team, Alexis Del Cid. Every four weeks, Denise Johnson arrives for her appointment with ophthalmologist Dr. Rodwan Ajlan. And full disclosure, Denise is my mom. When did you notice something was wrong with your eye? At one point, I noticed when I was watching television that if I closed my good eye, there was part of somebody's face was missing. She has macular degeneration in both eyes, but in her right eye, the one that doctors mark with the word yes, she has wet macular degeneration. Wet macular degeneration is the more severe form of the disease. People used to go blind from this. The injections my mom is about to get, and yes, they will go directly into her eye, are meant to save her vision. It's a special medication. Let's face it, nobody wants a shot in their eye. And unfortunately for my mom, her first experience being treated for this when she lived in another state was not the best. The first time I went for my first shot was Wisconsin and I was terrified. He really over explained everything and it was very fast paced and dramatic about it. Here it's Dr. Ajlan talks softly and gently and says you're doing fine and no worries and you're doing all the right things and it's like somebody's taking care of me. Luca? It looks worse than it feels. So. I told him this was the creepy part. Look down, look up, keep looking up, that's perfect. No pain? No pain. And just like that, it's over. Is my mom a good patient? Yes, she's an awesome patient. An awesome patient and mom with a pretty awesome doctor and a great prognosis moving forward if she sticks to the plan. All right. That is pretty cool stuff, and it can make you a little squeamish getting a shot in your eye. Joining us today is Denise Johnson, also known as Mom. I don't know which <laughs> word to call you in the program today. It may be Mom, it could be Dad. We'll try and stick with Miss Johnson, who just who we just saw receiving treatment for her wet macular degeneration. We're also joined by our ophthalmologist, Dr. Radwan 
Ajlan. How did I do with that? That's perfect. I did all right. Well, you said it was perfect when I mispronounced it. You're so darn nice. And Alexis Del Cid is standing by with community questions from our audience at home. Dr. Ajlan, explain the type of treatment you saw that we just saw you perform in, on Denise. What are you injecting into the eye? And give us a little more story about what wet macular degeneration really is. Because, you know, when you go pick up your book right now, your textbook, it will say to you, this is a really bad prognosis. But what I'm hearing is it's not as bad as it used to be. C correct, that's, that's exactly right. So we know that macular degeneration is the, main, like the most common cause for decreased vision in people over 50 in the US. That's based on the American Academy of Ophthalmology. Um, there are two forms of, of macular degeneration. There is the dry macular degeneration, which is the most common type. It's like 80% of patients have dry macular degeneration. And when it progresses even further, they can be developed and change to be wet macular degeneration. In dry macular degeneration, patients have thinning in the center of their vision, which is the part of the eye that's called macula. So there is thinning and buildup of some proteins called drusens. When it becomes wet, new blood vessels grow within the macula and they can start bleeding or leaking other fluids that damage the photoreceptors and cause decreased vision. Um, what we do for, for Denise or Ms. Johnson, I call her Ms. Johnson. Uh, yeah, I'm going to do the same thing. She's way too respectful. <laughs> uh, so we inject those medications inside the eye. There are, fami there are a family of drugs that work on some photo re on re chemical receptors on those sick blood vessels and cause them to shrink and stop bleeding and stop leaking. When this happens, the fluid and bleeding resorbs and patients' vision improves. So, and then we keep maintaining them like this so to help maintain their vision over a long time. Usually, we do this every month and then we start spacing the shots every three or four months. All right, well that's a great explanation. So why is the risk of blindness so much higher in wet macular degeneration? What makes it so much worse? Um, because patients have those sick blood vessels which can bleed and leak and those cause very rapid damage to the macula and patients lose their vision rapidly. Where a dry macular degeneration, it's really slow progressing, and patient can do other stuff in their daily activity and daily life to help slow the progression of that dry macular degeneration. All right, Ms. Johnson, um, I want to ask you the inside scoop on Alexis here in just a minute. So we'll get to that. <laughs> That's not in the script. We're going to have a little talk. But talk to us about your symptoms. How long did you uh, notice a change in your vision before you went to see a doc? Well, I. S I always see an eye doctor once a year, okay. so there's my plug. <laughs> but um, I, it was the Amsler grid. If, if Dr. Ajlan, if you want to tell them it, about that crisscrossy grid, uh, that absolutely. So yeah. um, the Amsler grid is a, is a sheet of paper with squares in it, and patient can monitor themselves at home. They check their eye, or in clinic, we ask the patient to look at it, and if they can start noticing wavy lines or crooked in their vision or like some areas that they're not seeing, we ask them to come and l let us know or let their ophthalmologist know as soon as possible to check the center of their vision. Mm -hmm. So you've been checking this at home for a while. Well, I was given um, one of those grids quite a while ago um, when my ophthalmologist in, um, um, I think it was in Chicago, uh, was checking my eyes and he said it <clears throat> looks like you're beginning to develop dry macular degeneration so he gave me the grid and he s we tested my eyes and there was a little wave on one little line and he said take this grid home and check every week and you let me know if anything looks worse and that went on for several years then um, it got a little worse in my right eye uh, still was looking like dry macular degeneration and then one day when I was watching television I noticed that half of half of the faces of the people on TV were blurry if I if I covered my other eye so I made an appointment right away and and yes it had turned into wet so um, that was just a couple years ago so actually not, not that almost long ago. Al less than two years ago uh-huh and, and uh -huh. just to say, does that happen? Is that how it usually you go wet to dry pr or dry to wet pretty fast? Um, yes, because that's why we, but Ms. Johnson did great and because that's what we ask from our patient. We provide them with the, with the Amsler grid and uh, they monitor themselves at home. So the key thing is 
If they catch it early, it's easier to start treating early and protect vision early. Um, so that's, that's the great thing you did. So. so you told us you were thrilled to meet Dr. Ajlan uh, compared to some other docs. Oh. Tell us a little bit about why that was and, and then talk to us, we're gonna talk a little bit about your treatment. Well, <clears throat> in Wisconsin, they kind of set you up to be scared. Um, and now, that, granted, this was during COVID. So um, they, they told me I couldn't breathe during the injection, hold, hold my breath. And uh, they went through all the possible bad things that could happen to you, to your eye, you know, if you moved and all this stuff. So I was terrified. And um, then when I came here, it was just so much, well, COVID was over. Not over, over, but, yeah. and uh, it just, they didn't make me feel scared, plus I'd had a shot already, and believe me, it's much worse looking at it <laughs> than it is to, to get a shot in your eye. So um, Dr. Ajlan is gentle, and he didn't, he didn't like talk down to me and tell me all the things I already knew about my eyes. He just was very methodical and said, explained right before he gave me every shot. First there's a numbing shot, and then there's the, the regular shot, and I, they just take care of you. It just, I just felt cared for and heard. No, it's a, it heard. is good to feel yeah. heard. So mm -hmm. do you have any side effects with these shots? Well, it's, um, once the anesthesia wears off, or whatever the numbing drops are, it feels kind of like you have something in your eye, you know? And the best thing you can do is keep your eyes closed. And so I, I go home and for a couple hours I get to um, listen to podcasts and music and doze. And then uh, it, use, eye, use those wetting eye drops and um, after a couple hours it starts to feel better and I just keep using those drops for the rest of the day. And has your vision yeah. gotten better with this? You know, I think it has. Yeah. yeah. How, are the lines straight or wavy? They're still, they're still wavy. There's still a spot where um, it's quite opaque. And uh, it's hard to explain, but I know when I'm watching, when I, when I test myself, can really I, I can see the faces clearer. You know, it's on, a good thing we have two eyes, isn't it? So one can yeah. still be a little better than the other. And I have dry in the other eye. Yeah. But luckily, um, it's just, it's like not having a problem. Excellent. It's, so yeah. Dr. Ashland, mm -hmm. Is this something to be discovered before your symptoms appear in a routine eye exam, or? Yes, so that's why, so it, I ask my patient to keep their annual checkup with their doctors, because that's something that can be discovered so early, like what happened with Ms. Johnson. And uh, the key thing is, if you catch it early before vision go down very much, you can protect their vision and keep their eye, like keep vision for a long time. Um, so it's something that can be discovered before it happens. So one of the things that, as I listen to the story, it or strikes before, me. Before it becomes symptomatic. Before it becomes symptomatic. Yeah. Sorry. Why is it that Ms. Johnson would have wet in one eye and be real stable in the other eye? Um, that's a good question. So this is, this is a, a good thing, actually, because the eye, so usually patients will have macular degeneration in both eyes, but what one eye will start to get worse more than the other, so we catch it early. So it's, it's a good thing, as you mentioned, we have two eyes, at least if, some, if you notice something in one eye, we start looking also to the other eye to protect it. Um, it's the normal natural history of the disease. Uh, if it's gonna get worse, it gets worse in one eye before it affects the other okay. eye. Okay, and so will this therapy lead to long-term stability? How well, most, do most people benefit? Or it sounds like it may have really changed the prognosis. Absolutely, so those injections and those like intravitreal injections in the eye have revolutionized the treatment for wet macular degeneration. Patients used to go blind from this. Like in the 70s and 80s, like when somebody has wet macular degeneration, that's, that's it, like we know that they will go blind. Yes, they were trying to do surgeries to rotate the macula or do different types of laser, it's not the same results, so. Yes, yes, yes. Well, let's take a look at this comparison between a healthy eye and, and uh, an eye with wet macular degeneration. Tell us what we're looking at. Um, so on the right, on the left side of the screen, we see a normal control eye, and to the right eye, we see the right eye photo, fundus photo inside Ms. Johnson's eye. 
it's this, the photo is zoomed out, but if, you, if we look at really near at the center, we see, like, they will, you will notice some pigment changes and drusens, that building of proteins within the macula. Compared to the other normal eye to the left side of the screen, we don't see any macular changes. You see that kind of greenish tint to the left eye, and on the right side you see all the orangish stuff. Is that part of the problem? That's an excellent observation. That's just a, just an artifact from the machine. That's a, that's a known thing that people published about. It's just the machine. The, it's the computer-generated image, so it's not, it's not actual. So the thing we're really looking for is how the vessels look so much more prominent on the right side because they were so much larger and you can really tell. And so that's, you don't really want that look in the back of your eyeballs, what I hear you say. Absolutely. All right. I like that my left eye gets tested every time I go in to get my right eye injected. Oh, well, yeah, I bet yeah. they do want, uh, I do what yeah. they want to. Mm -hmm. All right. So now let's take a look at Denise in, in particular too, or Ms. Johnson, you sent us some medical imaging that you have. What are we gonna be looking at on this imaging? So this photo is from last year. So this is what we call optical coherence tomography. This is a scan, we're scanning the center of vision here. And we are looking at the, if you see this band, that's the retina and there are so many dark spots within the retina and under the retina, those represent the leakage inside her eye. That's, that's the wet macular degeneration. And she has those bigger, like big bumps over there. That's part of the wet macular degeneration as well. Okay, so you don't want the bumpy thing but going on in the back of your eyeball like that, huh? We don't want those. <laughs> All no. right, no bumps, no, no, no vision. That's a bad thing. Okay, so what's the future look like? More trials, more drugs, maybe doing it without an injection, anything coming out in that regard? Yes, so there are so, there are so many treatments in development. So for, for the wet macular degeneration, there are so many treatments on new like medical medication agents that we can inject into the eye and KU is part of that and we are part of that um, and of course that makes us part of like that makes me have a conflict of interest too right um, but there are also gene therapies people are trying to develop some new gene therapies where we can inject have patients have only one injection and that gene therapy can create more of those chemicals that control wet macular degeneration. Uh, for That'd dry macular awesome. degeneration, there are so many things going on as well. Great. All right, well, this has been a fascinating thing. We're gonna know we could probably talk about it for hours at an end, and, uh, but uh, we're gonna want to answer some of your questions in just a moment, so send them to your the, the links in your screen on YouTube, Facebook, the X platform, or Twitter, or email the Medical News Network. Next, we're gonna check the COVID count with Dr. Dana Hawkinson, Hawkeye, Medical Director of Infection Prevention and Control here at the Health System. Hawk, yes. you look so much better. All oh, that man. rash, all that stuff that's in the past. You know, I got help from, from one of our docs. You know, Dr. Gear was, was instrumental in helping, but uh, I just don't know, it just took a long time for that to go. Um, she said it was probably one of the worst cases she had seen of significant uh, poison ivy. So. Yeah, so stay yeah. away from that. Okay, so the count. Yeah, so we've had, um, you know, increasing numbers uh, over this last week. We had had seven for the longest time. This uh, last week, we've now gone up to 14 active cases. Um, so we know that the virus is circulating more out there. We know that school has begun, so kids are going to be interacting more. It's just going to be a lot easier for that virus to circulate uh, as well. So right now, again, in the hospital, 14 active cases. Well, that is an, a marked increase, and I think we're seeing a lot of increase in mm. the community. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I would, I, I have to say, I believe we are back to widespread community transmission mm -hmm. of COVID-19 again. Yeah. There's a lot of positive cases we're hearing about. Yeah, I think so. And again, for the most part, who knows what this 14 means? I think we need to trend it out over the next couple weeks. Um, but just to your point, I think it is very important to understand there is probably more circulation. More people are getting it out in the community. Mm -hmm. They may or may not be testing at home. If you're sick, please stay home. Please wear a mask. Uh, but get yourself tested early, especially if you are high risk for complications and hospitalizations. Paxlovid still works for all of these variants that we've, un, uh, that we've identified. So understanding, having a plan, and then most important, when the booster is available, hopefully uh, later in September, and get the booster as well. Yeah, and I think um, I saw some data yesterday that the flu shot should have been available sometime beginning between September 5 and 19. Mm -hmm. COVID shot is probably toward the end of September, mm -hmm. RSV sometime in the, in the near future as well. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's interesting. 
I think there is a lot of community transmission going on right now. Mm -hmm. uh, we see it in the wastewater testing. There's yeah. quite a bit of COVID in that. Um, yet we're not seeing the same number of hospitalizations. I think that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to attribute that to a lot of baseline immunizations and the fact that a lot of people have already had COVID-19. I, I think that's that's true. I think we are, you know, into this. Uh, those most highest at-risk populations are going to be the ones that are most affected. Sure, we will still maybe see some people that are, are younger with no risk factors, but those people now that have the highest risk factors, again, age, comorbid conditions like heart, chronic heart disease, lung disease, kidney disease, diabetes, or and or immunocompromised are going to be the most at risk for hospitalization and severe disease. Hopefully, and I don't believe we will, but hopefully we will not see the, that large spike that we had seen in the past, uh, in the last couple of years. I'm still a little nervous about that, you know. We'll see how that mm -hmm. goes, but I'm going to cross my fingers yeah. and hope that you're right. Clearly you are so far, and I think that'll, hopefully that'll stick. But yeah. uh, to your point, and, even, and if you actually look at the patients we have hospitalized now, they are all folks who have more significant yeah. chronic disease and that I think that's yeah. why they're here. We're keeping an eye on BA 2.86. Yeah. We love how, mm -hmm. how we've now coded all these numbers, which tends to be more what we're calling highly mutated. Yeah. We think highly mutated, but yet it still has a spike protein. Yeah, absolutely. I think we have to remember that's exactly right. You know, this again is an Omicron sublineage. So just like all the r other sub variants that we have seen uh, recently, uh, this is a, a kind of a genetic tree, if you will, looking at um, the Omicron lineage and then all the sub variants after that. And far over to the left there, you can see where BA.2.6 is uh, more down into that middle area far on the right as well. You see where the last the EG1 was. Um, but again, just as you said, Steve, I think that's right. It's about spike protein uh, and the spike mutations. We know there are many other areas in the virus that could be mutated. And the CDC put out a statement about a week ago saying, look, there's not enough information yet to know if it causes more or uh, more severe disease. Uh, I certainly don't believe it will. I think we need to see a huge shift in other mutations in other parts of the virus to see significant changes in the actual severity of disease that it caused. But with this mutations in the spike, we know it can easily evade the antibodies, but just as we have said, we still have those T cells. And what we have found out so far through all of the other variants is that those areas that the T cells recognize on the spike really are conserved 80% or more from variant to variant. So that means we still have that immune response to that. Why is that important? Because the T cells are the biggest factor in helping prevent severe disease and hospitalization. All right. Well, we know you're going to have a lot of questions. Let's head to Studio B with Alexis Del Cid, also known as the daughter, standing by. Alexis. <laughs> Denise's daughter. <laughs> it's the best title ever. Um, Jean has a great question. Jean wants to know, is macular degeneration inherited? I'd like to know that, too. Uh, th that's an excellent question. Yeah. Uh, we know that we think that G like, if some diseases runs in family, so we, need, we think there is a gene, like there is, there is genetic correlation based on the American Academy of Ophthalmology and the American Retina Society, like American Society of Retina Specialist um, guidelines. But we don't know exactly which gene. So that's, that's the controversy. Some people say those genes are causing macular degeneration, others don't agree. So we don't know which one, but we think there is a linkage, yes. And then mom didn't, Yaya, my, my mom's mom, we call her Yaya, didn't she have it in one eye too? Yeah, she did, and she had it in both eyes, okay. and one was wet and one was dry, but unfortunately the injections hadn't been invented or perfected or whatever, and she did lose most of her sight in the eye with the wet, and um, your aunt, my sister, has dry uh, okay. in one or both eyes. So Alexis, are you getting evaluated? Are you? Do you go see the ophthalmologist to make sure you get checked? She's I, too young. <laughs> that's what I was going to ask. Should I? What, what age should I do that? I just want to say. Uh, no, no, you're, yeah, you're trying to be nice. I'm not so nice, Ashla. <laughs> I'm not, not, not being nice to you, though. Okay, okay so Alexis, what, uh, you know, clearly there's a family story here going on. So at right. what age, without asking Alexis how old she is. I can tell you. Okay, well, how old is she? <laughs> It's fine. Nine. Oh yep. my gosh, she's about to hit the big five. How old yep. does she have to be before she needs to be seen? So, 
So on regular cases for the regular checkup, but we know that macular degeneration is the most common cause for people over 50. So that's oh, that's so that's soon. The, so should soon. I start seeing? So I should soon. start seeing you. Yeah. Yeah. Lab, enjoy it, Dr. Seitz. Can make oh, all listen, the I'm, well, I'm, well past, <laughs> I'm well past 49, and I'm down in the ophthalmology clinic every three months, so don't worry. I'm, I'm down there all the time. I'm right behind you. Uh, June has a great question. June wants to know, is it possible to cure wet macular degeneration? Will what you're doing cure it? There is no way to cure it, but there are ways to slow it down. And, and for wet macular de degeneration, we can decrease the effect and stabilize it, but we cannot reverse it yet. Okay. Um, our Facebook viewer, Gene, has a question about COVID. Um, he wants to know, is it still five days of isolation and five days of mask wearing if you get COVID? Okay, we haven't changed from that. Yeah, you're exactly right, Steve. Yeah, that, there's been no update on those recommendations. And again, I think we, we need to say again, and we have, if you are ill, you know, obviously test early, but please don't go to work and, and uh, potentially spread it to other coworkers or other people uh, that you may be around. And they may have a disease you don't even know about. Yeah. And we have to remember, Hawkeye, what do the mm. rules of infection and prevention control do? They go with you wherever you are. Ah, and they still protect yeah, you. They do protect you. Uh, question about about the eyes again. This one's from George Georgian. Georgian uh, writes on Facebook. I have drusen and take vitamins to slow down the progression of macular degeneration. I don't see any changes in my vision yet, but had the drusen for a few years. I'm not sure what, what that is, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. How can I preserve my vision? This is scary. That's a good question. Uh, drusen is part of the dry macular degeneration process. Okay. Um, so in general, the recommendation is take your arid vitamin. If you smoke, stop smoking. Eat healthy, leafy, colorful vegetables and fish. L control the blood pressure. Um, if you're obese, try to decrease weight. Those are the risks factor so that really we can control. So really it's just like being, being healthy is really the key to, to, to controlling dry macular degeneration. Exactly. And exactly. A, lot of, a lot of leafy green vegetables. So it's kind of like the old Mediterranean diet thing again. Huh? Excellent. Keeps coming back. Which mm -hmm. I grew up on. And it's true. I'm not obese. No, and not. I eat my leafy greens mm -hmm. and uh, they spotted the juice and that was, I forgot that word, but that was uh, one of the first things the doctor saw. And I was following all the rules, but at that point, I started taking Aritz, which is an eye vitamin. Mm -hmm. What is drusen? Drusen are the protein buildup at the, at the macula, the retina, the center of vision. Okay. So Jane has a question along the, the um, what foods we should include. And mom, I know you're 100% Greek, so you really did grow up on the Mediterranean diet. Um, Jane wants to know, what are the specific foods we should include in our diets to support eye health? So, so that's a good question. So that's a general question. In general, try to eat healthy, colorful, and a lot of vegetables, right? For specifically macular, dry macular degeneration, the, the ARIDS vitamin supplements are recommended by the National Institute of Health. They include vitamin E, vitamin C, zinc, copper, lutein, and zeaxanthin. Some people take part of those vitamins, not the whole formula because they have other medical conditions, but those are the, the recommendations by the American Academy. Okay, we just have to back up for one second. So if you're Greek in ancestry, then your name was not originally Denise Johnson, I don't believe. <laughs> Devlantis. Devlantis. Okay, I, uh -huh. I, there you go. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, there you go. Alexis. If, if it ends in a vowel and an S, it's typically Greek. That's what I, I learned I, as a little girl. Usually, it's a couple of vowels right there together in the, in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mom, we're getting lots of comments about how people are impressed that you handled that shot in your eye like a champ. Well, thank you. It's. Mm. I tell you, it's um, much much better being getting the shot than watching it. <laughs> right. <laughs> and it's better than going blind. Right, right. You've always been very practical and calm about anything medical. So this has been really great. You're, you're, you're doing great, Mom. I know you were nervous. You yes, look I'm, like a natural up there. Are, you, are, are we making you nervous or are we trying to help you relax up here today? I'm, I'm not as nervous as I thought I would be. <laughs> Excellent. It's because we have such great bedside manner up here, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's absolutely. it, right? Yes. It may not be as yes. Dr. Ajlan, I think. Well, Dr. Ajlan now is going to, seems like he's going to be treating our entire family. Well, I think it sounds yeah. like he needs to be watching your entire family <laughs> yeah. for sure.
<laughs> yeah. All right, well, this has been a great discussion, but I've got one more question that you have to answer. All right, here it is. You ready? How hard was she to raise as a daughter? <laughs> was she a little, just a little crazy, a little out there sometimes? She was really nice until she turned 11. Oh, that, I had one of those. <laughs> I was pretty bad for about four years. Yeah. 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 But I came you around. Huh? You did. She came around. And now she calls you Mimi. She, I think she loves you a lot. That's pretty cool to watch, she huh? She certainly does. All right. That's <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, I'm grateful for all of our guests for being here. This has been so much fun, and I want to hear some final thoughts before we go. Ms. Johnson, final thoughts from you about your treatment and, 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 and your daughter. <laughs> well, the treatment, both are wonderful. The treatment's been uh, um, just a lifesaver. Yeah. Um, you know, vision is so important to all of us, and the thought of losing it is um, terrifying. And I was, you know, I watched my mom go through that, and she went from somebody who could do crossword puzzles, and teeny tiny little printing, to someone who couldn't do that anymore. and. Um, it was scary to think that that could happen, and I, you know, was, I'm thrilled to get the treatments. I'm thrilled that I found Dr. Ajlan, and uh, and about my daughter, I hope she somehow avoids <laughs> getting it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Alexis, I think you you should have a final thought here. And, and first of all, y'all do look a little alike. Just saying about that. And second of all, your mom, I think she likes you. Oh, that's <laughs> first of all, thank you for saying we look alike. That's a compliment. Um, I love my mom. To me. I'm, <laughs> I'm so grateful to get both my parents into the health system and into these doctors because I can tell you when my mom first called me um, about these shots she was getting in her eye, I was scared and I knew she was nervous. Like she said, it was very stressful. And so it's such a relief to be able to talk to my mom and she's able to get this treatment and she's having a good experience and she really does adore you, Dr. Ajlan. Um, which makes my heart feel full that she feels this way towards her doctor. So thank you for being so calm and kind. I, I right. appreciate it. I appreciate it. That Final thoughts it. from you, sir. Yeah. Um, I, I think I think um, well, I'm, I feel fortunate to have patients like you and to be part of KU family. Uh, KU have um, cutting edge technology, develop help develop new treatments, and we have all the current medication available in our systems compared to so many other nation, nation like top Ivy League locations in the, in the States. Um, I'll just say, stay healthy, don't smoke, and if you notice your vision change, see an eye doctor as soon as possible. Yeah. Excellent advice. Uh, advice. Dr. Hawk. Yeah, I think it's important, you know, going back to COVID, we will certainly keep you up to date on any new uh, variant news. Uh, but just as you said, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't continue to promote, you know, those pillars of infection prevention go with you wherever you are. Wash your hands frequently. Don't touch your eyes, uh, your nose, your mouth with your hands. Uh, wear a mask if you feel you need to. That is always appropriate. Be up to date with your vaccines and just understand exactly what kind of situation situation you are going into and protect yourself and your loved ones. If you're sick, keep your distance. Yeah. Hey man, I'm reminded of that song, put a lot of love in your heart. I'm not quite sure if I got the <laughs> words right there. I probably will stop right there. But you know, it's pretty cool. We talk a lot about faith, hope, and science. And today we've talked about faith, hope, science, and love. And man, when those are all in the room, you have a really full room. Thanks to all of our guests today. Thanks to all of you. Remember, faith, hope, science, and love. We'll be back soon. Coming up Friday on the Morning Medical Update. On Friday, we kick off Healthy Aging Month with a man named Merle. At 76, he golfs, walks, and kickboxes on a regular basis. You'll also hear from our experts some other things he could do to optimize his health and specific things you need to do and ask your doctor every year. Subscribe to our Morning Medical Update and Open Mics with Dr. Stites podcasts. Now everywhere podcasts are available.